The 1959 Tibetan Uprising or the 1959 Tibetan Rebellion began on 10 March 1959, when a revolt erupted in Lhasa, the capital of the Tibet area, which had been under the effective control of the People's Republic of China since the 17-point agreement was reached in 1951. Armed conflict between Tibetan guerrillas and the People's Liberation Army PLA had started in 1956 in the Kham and Amdu regions, which had been subjected to socialist reform. The guerrilla warfare later spread to other areas of Tibet and lasted through 1962. The anniversary of the uprising is observed by Tibetan exiles as the Tibetan Uprising Day. The anniversary of its end is officially celebrated in Tibet as Surs Emancipation Day. <laughs> Armed resistance in East Tibet In 1951, a 17-point agreement between the People's Republic of China and representatives of the Dalai Lama was put into effect. Socialist reforms such as redistribution of land were delayed in Tibet proper. However, Eastern Kham and Amdu Western Sichuan and Qinghai provinces in the Chinese administrative hierarchy were outside the administration of the Tibetan government in Lhasa, and were thus treated more like other Chinese provinces, with land redistribution implemented in full. The Kampas and nomads of Amdu traditionally owned their own land. Armed resistance broke out in Amdu and Eastern Kham in June 1956. Prior to the PLA invasion, relations between Lhasa and the Kampa chieftains had deteriorated, although the Kampa remained spiritually loyal to the Dalai Lama throughout. Because of these strained relations, the Kampa had actually assisted the Chinese in their initial invasion, before becoming the guerrilla resistance they are now known for. Pandatsing Rapga, a pro-Kuomintang and pro-Republic of China revolutionary Kampa leader, offered the governor of Chamdo, Nabo Nawang Jigma, some Kampa fighters in exchange for the Tibetan government recognizing the independence of Kham. Nabo refused the offer. After the defeat of the Tibetan army in Chamdo, Rapga started mediating in negotiations between the PLA and Tibetan rebels. Rapga and Topge engaged in negotiations with the Chinese during their assault on Chamdo. Kampas either defected to the Chinese PLA forces or did not fight at all. The PLA succeeded in the task. By 1957, Kham was in chaos. Resistance fighters attack and People's Liberation Army reprisals against Kampa resistance fighters such as the Chushi Gangdrik became increasingly brutal. Kham's monastic networks came to be used by guerrilla forces to relay messages and hide rebels. Punitive strikes were carried out by the Chinese government against Tibetan villages and monasteries. Tibetan exiles assert that threats to bomb the Potala Palace and the Dalai Lama were made by Chinese military commanders in an attempt to intimidate the guerrilla forces into submission. Lhasa continued to abide by the 17 point agreement and sent a delegation to Kham to quell the rebellion. After speaking with the rebel leaders, the delegation instead joined the rebellion. Kham leaders contacted the Central Intelligence Agency CIA, but the CIA under President Dwight D. Eisenhower insisted it required an official request from Lhasa to support the rebels. Lhasa did not act. Eventually the CIA began to provide covert support for the rebellion without word from Lhasa. By then the rebellion had spread to Lhasa which had filled with refugees from Amdu and Kham. Opposition to the Chinese presence in Tibet grew within the city of Lhasa. In mid-February 1959 the CCP Central Committee's administrative office circulated the Xinhua News Agency internal report on how the revolts in the Tibetan region have gathered pace and developed into a nearly full-scale rebellion. In a situation report for top CCP leaders. When Mao Zedong read it on 18 February, he commented. The more chaotic the situation in Tibet becomes the better, for it will help train our troops and toughen the masses. Furthermore, the chaos will provide a sufficient reason to crush the rebellion and carry out reforms in the future." The next day, the Chinese leader saw a report from the PLA General Staff's Operations Department describing rebellions by Tibetans in Sichuan, Yunnan, Gansu, and Qinghai. He again stressed that. Rebellions like these are extremely favorable for us because they will benefit us in helping to train our troops, train the people, and provide a sufficient reason to crush the rebellion and carry out comprehensive reforms in the future." The PLA used Chinese Muslim soldiers, who formerly had served under Ma Bufang to crush the Tibetan revolt in Amdu. In southern Kham, Wei cavalry were stationed. 
Topic: Lhasa Rebellion. On 1 March 1959, as a traditional event, a theatrical performance at the Chinese military headquarters outside Lhasa invited officials to attend. According to a communist source contradicting the 14th Dalai Lama's account, the Dalai Lama suggested proactively that he would like to attend. The Dalai Lama, at the time studying for his Larampa Geshe degree, initially postponed the meeting, but he eventually set for 10 March. On 9 March 3 p.m., Chinese army officer told Napoi Nawang Jigma that the Dalai Lama decided to attend the performance and other Tibetan officials could go directly as instructed by the Dalai Lama. Napoi Nawang Jigma found this was counter the tradition, but confirmed this from Tibetan official at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. and was involved to arrange the matter and talk to the chief officer. According to historian Sering Shakia, the Chinese government was pressuring the Dalai Lama to attend the National People's Congress in April 1959, in order to repair China's image in relation to ethnic minorities after the Kampa Rebellion. On 7 February 1959, a significant day on the Tibetan calendar, the Dalai Lama attended a religious dance, after which the acting representative in Tibet, Tan Guansan, offered the Dalai Lama a chance to see a performance from a dance troupe native to Lhasa at the Norbalinka to celebrate the Dalai Lama's completion of his Larampa Geshe degree. According to Napoi Nawang Jigma, the Dalai Lama proactively asked to attend the performance. According to the Dalai Lama's memoirs, the invitation came from Chinese General Chang Chin Wu, who proposed that the performance be held at the Chinese military headquarters. The Dalai Lama states that he agreed. The planned performance date of the 10th of March was only finalized five days beforehand, on the 5th of March. Neither the Kashag nor the Dalai Lama's bodyguards were informed of the Dalai Lama's plans until Chinese officials briefed them on 9 March, one day before the performance was scheduled, and insisted that they would handle the Dalai Lama's security. The Dalai Lama's memoirs state that on 9 March the Chinese told his chief bodyguard that they wanted the Dalai Lama's excursion to watch the production conducted in absolute secrecy and without any armed Tibetan bodyguards, which all seemed strange requests and there was much discussion amongst the Dalai Lama's advisors. Some members of the Kashag were alarmed and concerned that the Dalai Lama might be abducted, recalling a prophecy that told that the Dalai Lama should not exit his palace. According to historian Sering Shakia, some Tibetan government officials feared that plans were being laid for a Chinese abduction of the Dalai Lama, and spread word to that effect amongst the inhabitants of Lhasa. On 10 March, several thousand Tibetans surrounded the Dalai Lama's palace to prevent him from leaving or being removed. The huge crowd had gathered in response to a rumor that the Chinese were planning to arrest the Dalai Lama when he went to a cultural performance at the PLA's headquarters. This marked the beginning of the uprising in Lhasa, though Chinese forces had skirmished with guerrillas outside the city in December of the previous year. Although CCP officials insisted that the reactionary upper stratum in Lhasa was responsible for the rumor, there is no way to identify the precise source. At first, the violence was directed at Tibetan officials perceived not to have protected the Dalai Lama or to be pro-Chinese. Attacks on Chinese started later. One of the first casualties of mob was a senior lama, Pagbala Soinam Gyamko, who worked with the PRC as a member of the preparatory committee of the Tibetan Autonomous Region, who was killed and his body dragged by a horse in front of the crowd for 2 kilometers, 1.2 miles. On the 12th of March, protesters appeared in the streets of Lhasa declaring Tibet's independence. Barricades went up on the streets of Lhasa, and Chinese and Tibetan rebel forces began to fortify positions within and around Lhasa in preparation for conflict. A petition of support for the armed rebels outside the city was taken up, and an appeal for assistance was made to the Indian consul. Chinese and Tibetan troops continued moving into position over the next several days, with Chinese artillery pieces being deployed within range of the Dalai Lama's summer palace, the Norbalinka. On 15 March, preparations for the Dalai Lama's evacuation from the city were set in motion, with Tibetan troops being employed to secure an escape route from Lhasa. On 17 March, two artillery shells landed near the Dalai Lama's palace, triggering his flight into exile. The Dalai Lama secretly left the palace the following night and slipped out of Lhasa with his family and a small number of officials. The Chinese had not strongly guarded the Potala, as they did not believe it likely that the Dalai Lama would try to flee. Rumors about the Dalai Lama's disappearance began to spread rapidly on the next day, though most still believed that he was in the palace. 
Meanwhile, the situation in the city became increasingly tense, as protesters had sized a number of machine guns. On 20 March, the Chinese army responded by shelling the Norbalinka to disperse the crowd, and placed its troops at a barricade that divided the city into a northern and southern part in the following night. The battle began early on the following day, and even though the Tibetan rebels were outnumbered and poorly armed, the street fighting proved to be bloody. The last Tibetan resistance was centered on the Jokhang, where Kampa refugees had set up machine guns, while a large number of Tibetans circumambulated the temple in reverence. The PLA started to attack the Jokhang on 23 March, and a hard-fought, three-hours-long battle with many casualties on both sides ensued. The Chinese eventually managed to break through using a tank, whereupon they raised the flag of China on the temple, ending the uprising. Two British writers, Stuart and Roma Gelder, visited the Chensel Fodrang Palace in the Norbalinka in 1962 and found its contents meticulously preserved. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Republic of China's involvement and its position on Tibetan independence. Pandatsing Rapka, a pro-Kuomintang and pro-Republic of China revolutionary Kampa leader, was instrumental in the revolt against the Communists. The Kuomintang had a history of using Kampa fighters to oppose both the Dalai Lama's Tibetan government, and battle the Communist Red Army. Rapka continued to cooperate with the ROC Kuomintang government after it fled to Taiwan. They provided training to Kampa rebels against the Communist PLA forces. The Republic of China on Taiwan disputed with America whether Tibet would be independent, since the ROC claimed Tibet as part of its territory. Rapga agreed to a plan in which the revolt against the communists would include anti feudalism, land reform, a modern government, and to give power to the people. The Republic of China continued to claim Tibet as an integral part of its territory in accordance with its constitution, contrary to the claims of the Dalai Lama's Central Tibetan Administration, which claimed Tibetan independence. After the 1959 Tibetan Rebellion, Chiang Kai-shek announced in his letter to Tibetan friends Chinese, Gao Shi Kang Tong Bao Shu Pinyin, Gao Qizang Tong Bao Shu that the ROC's policy would be to help the Tibetan diaspora overthrow the People's Republic of China's rule in Tibet. The Mongolian and Tibetan Affairs Commission sent secret agents to India to disseminate pro-Kuomintang and anti-communist propaganda among Tibetan exiles. From 1971 to 1978, the MTAC also recruited ethnic Tibetan children from India and Nepal to study in Taiwan, with the expectation that they would work for a ROC government that returned to the mainland. In 1994, the Veterans Association for the Tibetan Guerrilla Group Chushi Gangdrik met with the MTAC and agreed to the KMT's One China Principle. In response, the Dalai Lama's Central Tibetan Administration forbade all exiled Tibetans from contact with the MTAC. Tibetans in Taiwan, who are mostly of Kham origin, support the Republic of China's position that Tibet is part of the ROC, and are against both the Tibetan exile community in India who live under the Tibetan government in exile and the communists in mainland China. The Taiwanese Tibetans are considered traitors by the TGE for their position. Casualties <coughs> 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 Professor Colin McCarris states, "...there was a major rebellion against Chinese rule in Tibet in March 1959, which was put down with the cost of much bloodshed and lasting bitterness on the part of the Tibetans." The Tibetan government in exile reports variously, 85,000, 86,000, and 87,000 deaths for Tibetans during the rebellion, attributed to "...secret Chinese documents captured by guerrillas." Tibetologist Tom Grunfeld said, the veracity of such a claim is difficult to verify." Warren W. Smith, a writer with Radio Free Asia, writes that the "...secret documents," came from a 1960 PLA report captured by guerrillas in 1966, with the figures first published by the TGIE in India in 1990. Smith states that the documents said that 87,000 "...enemies were eliminated," but he does not take "...eliminated," to mean "...killed." as the TGIE does. A Tibetan government in exile TGIE official surnamed Samdup released a report for Asia Watch after three fact-finding missions from 1979 to 1981, stating that a speech by Premier Zhou Enlai, published in Beijing Review in 1980, confirmed the 87,000 figure. Demographer Yan Hao could find no reference to any such figure in the published speech, and concluded. 
if these TGIE sources are not reluctant to fabricate Chinese sources in open publications, how can they expect people to believe in their citations of so-called Chinese secret internal documents and speeches that are never available in originals to independent researchers?" Aftermath Lhasa's three major monasteries Sara, Gandan, and Drepung were seriously damaged by shelling, with Sara and Drepung being damaged nearly beyond repair. According to the TGIE, members of the Dalai Lama's bodyguard remaining in Lhasa were disarmed and publicly executed, along with Tibetans found to be harboring weapons in their homes. Thousands of Tibetan monks were executed or arrested, and monasteries and temples around the city were looted or destroyed. The CIA officer, Bruce Walker, who oversaw the operations of CIA trained Tibetan agents, was troubled by the hostility from the Tibetans towards his agents. The radio teams were experiencing major resistance from the population inside Tibet. The CIA trained Tibetans from 1957 to 1972, in the United States, and parachuted them back into Tibet to organize rebellions against the PLA. In one incident, one agent was immediately reported by his own brother and all three agents in the team were arrested. They were not mistreated. After less than a month of propaganda sessions, they were escorted to the Indian border and released. In April 1959, the 19-year-old Choki Gyaltsen, 10th Panchen Lama, the second-ranking spiritual leader in Tibet, residing in Shigatse, called on Tibetans to support the Chinese government. However, after a tour through Tibet, he wrote a document in May 1962 known as the 70,000 character petition addressed to Zhou Enlai criticizing Chinese abuses in Tibet, and met with Zhou to discuss it. The outlined petition dealt with the brutal suppression of the Tibetan people both during and after the PRC's invasion of Tibet and the sufferings of the people in the Great Leap Forward. In this document, he criticized the suppression that the Chinese authorities had conducted in retaliation for the 1959 Tibetan uprising. But in October 1962, the PRC authorities dealing with the population criticized the petition. Chairman Mao called the petition a poisoned arrow shot at the party by reactionary feudal overlords." In 1967 the Panchen Lama was formally arrested and imprisoned until his release in 1977. Chinese authorities have interpreted the uprising as a revolt of the Tibetan elite against communist reforms that were improving the lot of Tibetan serfs. Tibetan and third-party sources, on the other hand, have usually interpreted it as a popular uprising against the alien Chinese presence. Historian Sering Shakia has argued that it was a popular revolt against both the Chinese and the Lhasa government, which was perceived as failing to protect the authority and safety of the Dalai Lama from the Chinese. See also 1987–1991 Tibetan unrest 2008 Tibetan unrest Events leading to the Sino-Indian War Gandan Fodrang History of Tibet 1950 present Incorporation of Tibet into the People's Republic of China List of wars involving the People's Republic of China Sinicization of Tibet Tibetan resistance since 1950 Tibetan sovereignty debate Topic References Topic Citations Topic Sources Topic External Links March Winds, March seventh, two thousand nine Jamyang Norbu Tibetan Government in Exile's account of the events leading to the March tenth, nineteen fifty nine, uprising Kopal, Dave, The Dalai Lama's Army National Review, April 5, 2007. Patterson, George N. The Situation in Tibet The China Quarterly, No. 6. April Jun, 1961, pp. 81–86. Ginsburg, George and Mathos, Michael. Communist China's Impact on Tibet, The First Decade. Far Eastern Survey, Vol. 29, No. 7, July, 1960, pp. 102–109. The Tibetan Uprising of 1959 The Tibetan Rebellion of 1959 and China's changing relations with India and the Soviet Union.